I couldn't. Thank you, Jordan. Um, this uh, hopefully will be kind of fun. I want to engage you in a conversation here uh, and start off, first of all, by saying that um, a lot of the, in fact, almost all of the terrific work that Jordan just described is actually due to things that he and his colleagues on the facility side have been implementing over the past few years. And it's really put UCSB in a very, very strong position. We actually have the best record in terms of energy efficiency uh, implementation deployment. Um, and I'll show you some, some numbers that will uh, back that up. But uh, there are basically three things I want to do. First of all, I want to tell you what this initiative is about. Um, second, uh, what it plans to do to achieve this very, very uh, ambitious goal. And then third, uh, I want to talk about UCSB in terms of just how we can play in this uh, scenario in different ways, and uh, especially some points about uh, some of the research that still needs to be done, because uh, that's going to be important to uh, accomplish this. And some of that research may interest you uh, in terms of projects, uh, both students and faculty. Um, so I also have to make a confession, first of all, that when I first heard about this, um, I said, <laughs> that's crazy. Nobody's ever going to do that. Um, that was about uh, almost a year ago that uh, the UC president, Janet Napolitano, made this announcement that uh, all 10 campuses of the UC system would be carbon neutral by 2025. And, uh, What's not widely known is that the, uh, the notion of carbon neutrality was already on the books. The, the, it, it, however, was set for a goal to be established by 2050. And that goes back about three or four years. So when Janet came into office, she asked, well, what's happening with the carbon neutrality? And she didn't get much of an answer because everybody was thinking, well, 2050s <laughs> way down there. And so she said, well, let's move it up front and see what happens. And, and that's what she did. Um, she moved it up to 2025. And that got people's attention. Um, the uh, important distinction here is that this applies only to scope one and two uh, emissions. Uh, scope three, and I'll explain in a moment what these are. Uh, is still to be achieved in 2050. Um, what's scope one, two, and three? Well, basically, scope one is, for us, largely on-site combustion. It's emissions that we do here on campus. Uh, scope two is purchased electricity. When we buy our electricity, as we do from Southern California Edison, they have to use a combination of different sources, fossil fuels, hydro, and other sources. And uh, we, um, we have to uh, uh, take responsibility for the fact that that's not fossil free and does contribute to uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And then scope three, the single biggest part actually for us is uh, employee air travel. Uh, all those wonderful trips that uh, folks make uh, add up rather fast. In fact, uh, you can double your carbon footprint by just doing about three or four uh, trips, uh, round trips to Europe or Asia uh, that easily. Um, actually, only a couple of round trips. Uh, you do about three or four across to the East Coast and back each year, you're doubling your carbon footprint. Um, and I've made myself rather unpopular with some of my colleagues by uh, calculating for them their carbon footprint. <laughs> um, but we won't get into that. Uh, now, um, it's not such an audacious goal. And in fact, uh, if you just look at the electricity piece of it, putting aside the, the natural gas, and there are two big components that we're concerned with here in terms of scope one and scope two emissions. One is generation of electricity, and the second is uh, natural gas, uh, which is used for various sources um, uh, on different campuses. And I'll, I'll explain that in a moment. But if for the moment you just look at electricity, there are, well, there's one country that's actually at 100% renewable now, and that's Iceland. And of course, they did that with a combination of hydro and geothermal, which are two very unique resources that they have. 
But they're, they're there already at 100%. They're, they're still using some natural gas for heating and producing some emissions for that. Uh, Switzerland is also uh, right behind them. Norway, almost all, very interesting, Norway has really made it big time with um, hydro. Uh, some other interesting things, Denmark, you may know, is the single largest, and this is a percentage, okay? Single largest percentage of its electricity of any country comes from wind. They've really done a lot in that regard. Interestingly, Italy is the, percentage-wise, again, the largest uh, in terms of investments in solar. We're down here, okay? A little more than 30% currently um, in terms of uh, where we are. Um, this is what I said, okay? If you're worried about your carbon footprint, um, this is the uh, U.S. per capita emission average. Uh, you can add these in very quickly just by doing a few trips. You can, as I said, double, triple. But, but we're not going not gonna to make, I'm not going to shame you today. Um, rather, I want to take an upbeat approach on this and show you, first of all, some statistics universally wide. And one of the neat things about this project is that it's got people thinking about the University of California, the University of California as an entity rather than 10 independent campuses. Um, uh, because to accomplish this goal, it's going to require an enormous amount of cooperation and collaboration between the campuses. And also, it's not just although this uh, goal was established out of Oakland from the office of the president, it's one that clearly is going to require enormous buy-in and, and, and ownership uh, by each of the campuses if it's going to be successful. But so let's just first look system-wide. You see all 10 campuses. Uh, this is, uh, don't have it here, but this is millions of metric tons per year. This is the total amount of the UC. Uh, we are about 5% of this. I'll show you some detailed numbers in a moment for the UCSB campus. Um, we're one of 10 campuses, but we're smaller than average. And we come in at about 5% of this, actually a little less than 5%. Um, uh, this is the 2020 policy goal that was set a few years ago. And what's interesting is that the carbon emissions have been reduced, not a lot, but they have been reduced. And this, you have to remember, is in spite of considerable growth in terms of the university uh, system. The addition, for, for example, first of all, of a whole new campus at Merced, which, by the way, every single building being done at, uh, being built at Merced is energy efficient and meets high level LEED certification. They're, they're really off to a very good start at Merced in that regard. They made it a very high priority. Of course, it was a unique opportunity for them starting from scratch to do that. Uh, and th this is scope one, two, and three. So this is the uh, 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 other things, campus travel, uh, individual travel, business travel, commuting, things like that. And it's been pretty level. Uh, when you put it down to scope one and two, it's in the right direction. But clearly, if you extrapolate this, you're not going to get there by 2025. You're going to be way off. So something has to happen. And uh, one of the things, as Jordan mentioned, uh, that's very important is energy efficiency savings. It's a little hard to see, but basically there have been uh, close to $200 million of energy efficient savings. Uh, uh, actually here, the correct figure, I think, is 151,000. And this is since 2004, which is really quite impressive. Uh, uh, that's an enormous amount of uh, energy saved. And, and that's where this 100,000 uh, metric tons of carbon dioxide reduced has, has a large part of it has come from. There are actually two sources. The second one I'll show you in a moment. And this, this has been uh, funded largely by three sources, uh, bonds that were uh, made available and, and issued by the University of California system, some borrowing from the campuses themselves, and, and also from grants from IOUs. IOUs are in, investor-owned utilities. Southern California Edison is, is an example. They put up some money to uh, invest in energy efficiency measures. And for those of you who don't know it, it's important uh, that um, 
energy uh, savings um, from investments in energy efficiency pay for themselves. The payback periods may be as short as three to five years or 10 years or more. But those, if they're wisely chosen, those um, actually pay for themselves at no net cost. So borrowing money to do this is really a very wise investment. We've done a lot of this, especially at our campus here at UCSB. There's an opportunity to do more, but the next stage of this is going to be more challenging because we've done a lot of the easy things. Um, there's even a term that is being used now for the next stage, which is called deep energy efficiency, um, just to emphasize the fact that it will be more challenging. The, um, come on, let's change. The second uh, reason that there has been a reduction in both energy utilization and carbon dioxide emissions is that a number of the campuses have installed cogeneration facilities. These are combined heat and power on site. Most of them are natural gas fired turbines. The turbine, because it's a mechanical device, runs an electric generator. You get electricity from that. And you capture the waste heat. These turbines are typically no better than 40% efficient, so you get a lot of heat as well generated from burning the natural gas, and that uh, enables you to provide heating for your campus as well. The, um, and this, this is more efficient than buying electricity from an, a, a, a utility and having your own boilers burning natural gas to do the heating. The downside of this is that if you want to go now to zero emissions, you've got this humongous big natural gas load that you have to deal with. These campuses were really in a great shape uh, before this initiative was introduced. Um, many of them have achieved something like 80 to 90 percent self-sufficiency in terms of energy, both uh, electricity and heat which is great and at considerable cost savings. Uh, but they are facing a major challenge in terms of what to do to get now to the next stage, which is zero emissions. And, uh, and I'm going to show you some of the um, examples that uh, are proposed to deal with that issue. Just to give you some, come on, clicker, let's go. <laughs> I think we're running out of batteries on the clicker. So uh, these are the campuses that have uh, cogen facilities. And these are big. Uh, the uh, capacity of these, as I said, is, uh, to put this into perspective, our electrical uh, capacity or our electrical load averages somewhere between 8 and 13 or 14 megawatts, OK? These are bigger campuses, but it means that they're supplying uh, power to their campus that is uh, pretty close to uh, being self-sufficient. Most of these are running on natural gas. A few of them have a little piece of, uh, and I'll show you some details on this, of biogas that they've been introducing. And this is partly an experiment. Um, we aren't on this list because we chose, for better or for worse, not to invest in cogen. It's, it's sort of working now, on and off, yeah. Um, so this is, I went to a bunch of meetings, as uh, uh, Jordan mentioned, uh, and actually how this happened was Mike Witherell, our <clears throat> Vice Chancellor for Research, called me up one day and said, David, how would you like to uh, be on Janet's committee on this carbon neutral? I said, sure, why not? <laughs> I don't know what it's about, but I'll go. And uh, there have been a number of meetings of what's called the Global Climate Leadership Council, which is a group of people, representatives from many of the campuses, not all. Uh, and I was asked to be UCSB's rep, uh, especially with regard to the research initiatives that might be needed to accomplish this goal. And at the first meeting, um, this uh, graphic was shown as, OK, folks, here's the solution, <laughs> a triangle. Um, we're going to get the carbon neutrality by, first of all, large-scale biomethane development. OK, and that's going to replace natural gas. Um, 
Second is we're going to put lots of, of uh, uh, renewables both on campus and off campus. And we're also going to do lots of energy efficiency. OK. Um, sounds good. Let's see what's happening. Um, well, the first thing is actually pretty spectacular. And this was announced just last month. Uh, the University of California system, for, on behalf of the campuses, uh, made two major, uh, these are the largest deals that any university in the United States has made to date with regard to solar. Uh, 80 megawatts is a lot. Um, and, and again, reference point, OK? Our campus only needs about 10 to 15 megawatts of electricity to keep it going, OK? 80 megawatts, uh, two actual sites, both of them in um, uh, Fresno County. And um, this is all through a third party. Um, most of you probably never heard of this firm. I haven't either, Frontier Renewables. They basically, the way this works is the university makes a deal, a contract with this organization called Frontier Renewables for 25 years to purchase electricity at a certain rate. Uh, with an acceleration clause and options to buy at certain points and things like that and all kinds of details as to what happens if, if Frontier Renewables goes belly up or something like that. And, uh, and they own it and operate it and, and provide the electricity to uh, the University of California. Actually, what they're going to do is they're, pump, they're going to pump it into the grid and get credits. And uh, this is all made possible, actually, by virtue of the fact that the University of California system is now regarded as an energy services unit, which means that they can participate in the wholesale market for electricity. They can buy it, they can sell it, as though they were their own utility. And that's new and very special, because it means that, that pricing can be more advantageous, and also deals like this are possible. Now, why aren't we listed here in getting some of this power? That's because. Um, um, most of you in this room, well, I guess some of you are old enough to remember Enron. Uh, Enron almost ruined the state of California with regard to electricity. And it was because there was a deregulation of electricity and people were buying and selling in a crazy way. And it was a fiasco, just a disaster. And the state imposed then restrictions on who could and could not participate in the wholesale markets. And some folks <clears throat> are able to do that, and some are not. We are not, currently. Uh, we don't have access to, to the what's called direct access to the wholesale markets. And so uh, we're at a disadvantage. That, um, there's a movement to change that. Uh, and um, not clear just uh, how difficult that will be. It may be possible for us, because of the way these credits are being developed, for us to actually participate without getting um, legal direct access to the wholesale market. Uh, but that's, for us, uh, an issue that needs to be clarified um, going forward. So the, and Jordan is working on a terrific project, um, uh, which is taking advantage of the fact that the price of solar has really come down enormously in the past few years. Um, this is uh, data that was uh, just recently uh, published by, interestingly, this firm, Lazard, is an investment house. And, and that's why I like this data, because these folks are only interested in making money. They're not uh, renewable jockeys like you and me. They, they are just in this business because they, they want to make money. And this is uh, information they have um, uh, sought and uh, accumulated and analyzed for their client investors. And it's really uh, amazing. It's, it's still going down, although the rate is, uh, is, is slowing. And, and what's really interesting, and there's a lot of data here. I want to draw your attention to just these four red circles. This is the cost of what's called levelized electricity. That's taking all the costs, the, the capital investment amortized over a reasonable lifetime, the operating cost, the cost of fuel, maintenance, transmission, all of that. Okay, This is the cost of electricity. Uh, and uh, 
it's in dollars per megawatt hour, but you can convert this. This is five cents a kilowatt hour if you're thinking about it. And the current winner is combined cycle gas. That's a gas turbine where you actually um, <clears throat> have two sections and the unused energy in the first one drives the second turbine. And they're fairly efficient. And with the current price of natural gas, that's uh, the best way to generate electricity. But look where uh, grid level solar PV is. It's really, and this is unsubsidized, okay? It's really competitive today. And, uh, and, and that's really um, something that's just happened quite recently. In fact, this outfit, Lazard, publishes this report once a year. And this is the first time that they, and they made a big noise about it, that, that uh, grid level solar is now competitive with uh, natural gas fired turbines. And uh, that's a significant uh, result. Uh, what's this over here? Battery storage. This is the big problem, which I'm going to point to in a moment. That, uh, so you might look at this and naively say, wow, OK, no emissions for this stuff. Let's just do all solar, OK? We'll just plaster every single building with solar, and that wouldn't be enough. And we'll put solar all over every open lot and take all the parking lots and everything, and we'll be home free. No, because electricity from solar, as we know, only comes when the sun is shining. And uh, the cost of storage is still out of sight. Um, uh, it's three to five times what it should be to enable uh, uh, such things as uh, grid-level batteries. Yes, Phil? You commented that the wind is lower than both. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. And um, wind is much more widely deployed in the US today than it is. Um, it's an option for the University of California. Uh, and I'll show you in a moment uh, how that might evolve. Um, and possibly with a combination of solar and wind, you can do a little better. But unfortunately, the wind doesn't blow exactly when you want it to either. And so storage is still um, a big challenge. It's, uh, um, I'm going to end up identifying three grand challenges for this Okay, that I think are, are going to require some substantial investment, especially in research, to make this happen. But, but, but it probably can be done. Uh, so this, what's this? This is a picture of the variability of uh, two sources of renewable energy, wind and solar. Wind is the blue thing. It's all over the map. This is 30 days worth of, uh, of uh, data, OK? And, and each line here represents one day. So one day the wind is blowing one way, and the next day it's not blowing. And it's, it's all over the map, OK? Solar also fluctuates because of clouds and fog here and other things like that. But the, the general trend in solar is a pretty well-defined curve that actually peaks up, as we know, midday with the sun and all. And, and, and that's OK. Um, demand, and this is demand, uh, and I'm going to show you some more specific demand curves in a moment. But demand tends to be like this, OK? Uh, and you may say, well, why doesn't it peak up in the middle of the day? That's because you go home and you turn on your TVs and you turn on your lights and your stoves and everything and the same in the morning. And uh, so there's a curve that's called the duck curve that the utilities talk about. And this is that same uh, demand curve, except here now we've added in renewables, OK? Uh, it starts coming down because, and this is uh, mostly solar, and so it's, 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 it's actually uh, reducing the demand and meeting the demand better in the middle of the day. But what you have then is this uh, evening and morning period when there is a still very high demand for electricity. But solar can't really do a heck of a lot about it. And what's even worse is that you have these very significant ramp ups. This is an enormously steep curve that means that, that the utilities have to, or if you are your own utility, you have to turn something on and ramp it up very quickly to meet that demand. Um, there are special peaking turbines, so-called, that do this. Um, they're more costly than turbines that are running at a fixed rate. Um, and, and consequently, during those times, you actually pay more for electricity. And this is a feature that Jordan is taking advantage of with a new system, which will be up to four megawatts to be installed on this campus. 
the pricing looks very favorable, largely because of the fact that solar is available at times when um, the, the actual price, and we pay an average of about 11 cents a kilowatt hour, but during peak periods it can be as high as, what, 15 cents, Jordan, something like that, right? Um, so storage, um, the predominant uh, method of storing at grid, storing energy at grid level uh, today is pumped hydro, uh, and and that's you know 95 percent of the storage. And these are systems that have been around for a long period of time. They're unfortunately uh, not easy to, you know, you might say, well, let's just go out and build a whole lot of pumped hydro. Um, that's just not easy to do for environmental reasons, and also the land required is substantial. Um, I don't have a slide for it, but there's actually a neat startup company in uh, Santa Barbara called Ares, which is a um, uh, rail storage system. Um, and what does the, the A stand for? I'm trying to remember. But basically what it is, it's, is it's a mechanical version of pumped hydro where you take an electric train, a, a full-scale electric train, not a model train, a full-scale electric train, you load it up with ballast, and you drive it up a mountain. And then you reverse the engines and make them generators when you want to extract the energy coming down. These folks claim they can get about 90% round-trip efficiency that way. And there's actually a 50 megawatt prototype being built in Nevada uh, based on that principle. Um, Battery storage is just a tiny piece of the uh, activity in storage today. Thermal storage is largely uh, molten salt in connection with uh, solar thermal. Um, there's a big facility in the Mojave Desert that uh, is uh, just coming online that uses that now. Compressed air, some folks think that's the solution, but it's, uh, there are those who, who, who feel otherwise. Um, Another one that um, is getting, it's been around for about 20 years, but is getting increased attention, is to generate hydrogen by hydrolysis and then store it and use it in a fuel cell uh, to bring back the electricity. Unfortunately, this round trip efficiency is only about 35% and not uh, cost competitive yet, but there's an opportunity to develop it and, and improve it. Okay, so what about all these folks who made these hor horrifically big investments in natural gas on-site cogeneration facilities? Um, this is proposed to be the solution. Biomethane from organic waste. Um, uh, dairy, municipal solid waste, that's a nice word for uh, human waste. Um, landfill, food processing, uh, also restaurants and wineries and things. There's an awful lot of of organic substance that we waste, we throw out, and, and actually can be converted quite readily to uh, methane. Um, and again, the, our colleagues in Europe are ahead of us, but first let me just show you a few prototypes that are already in place at uh, some of the campuses. Um, San Diego has a 2.8 megawatt, uh, it's a joint project with the city of San Diego, and uh, what they're doing is they're generating methane from uh, a wastewater treatment plant um, and uh, using it to generate electricity in a fuel cell on campus. And it's providing today 2.8 megawatts of their electricity, which is a small fraction, but an important one. Uh, probably not cost effective. It's hard to get some actual numbers on cost for this, but, but it is there. At uh, Davis, uh, this is a project that's just uh, coming online and will be operative, I'm told, in January or February. This is uh, uh, a, uh, what's called an anaerobic biodigester, which is a fermentation process where agricultural waste and other waste coming from food companies, restaurants, is basically uh, fermented with, uh, by uh, some friendly bacteria that uh, both break it up and then convert it into uh, biogas. Biogas consists of about 60% methane, but there's also some hydrogen sulfide, some uh, uh, carbon dioxide, there's some NOx, some SOx. You have to clean it up before you can actually use it as, uh, 
as if it were totally equivalent to natural gas, uh, which is about 90 to 95 percent methane. Uh, but this is uh, um, coming online, and they expect to produce about a megawatt of electricity uh, by that method. Uh, UCLA uh, also has a facility um, that uh, is um, it's actually uh, underneath a golf course, I'm told, which is kind of neat. Um, uh, and it's, uh, <clears throat> uh, it's a uh, landfill site, um, which uh, they are using. And it generates actually uh, uh, about four megawatts, which is a significant amount. And it's helping to reduce their dependence on natural gas in their cogen system, which is a big one, a 43 megawatt system. Uh, so let's take a closer look at what is all this uh, business of biomethane. Uh, as I said, it's basically a process of taking uh, organic uh, material, manure, waste, food, other things like that, and uh, breaking it down um, in a fermentation process by two steps. Uh, one, just to break it into uh, 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 usable form, and then also to uh, produce uh, uh, methane um, and, and other things in the process. Um, and the Department of Agriculture actually just, uh, together with EPA and DOE, just issued a um, very interesting report where they say the potential for developing this in the U.S. is really substantial. Um, and it said the way it works is you collect organic waste uh, you feed it into a digester. You have to clean it up, if you're, especially if you're going to feed it into a pipeline. The biodigester also produces some solid um, output, which actually is useful for making fertilizer and things like that. So it's actually, if you view this as a sustainable process, it's really, really uh, quite effective. And the way you justify it is, uh, of course, when you burn this biogas, you're still producing carbon dioxide. but what you're doing is you're capturing that um, uh, biomethane, which especially for dairy farms is just now being released freely as methane into the air and being anywhere from 20 to 30 times more potent a greenhouse gas. You've really accomplished a lot in that regard. So uh, it's a question of credits here that, that you're, you're taking a, a, a substance methane that's now being released into the atmosphere. And it's estimated that um, within the US, about 1% of the uh, anthropogenic contribution to greenhouse gases is coming from uh, methane of this sort, from landfill, from uh, agricultural waste, and other such sources. So um, there's a potential here to, to do something. It's not simple, um, requires a uh, some cooperation uh, with people in agricultural and other industries. And, um, uh, but the potential is, is interesting. Um, just a little note here is that natural gas today accounts for 63% of UC's energy consumption. It's a big amount. And again, Europe is out front, um, especially Germany and Sweden. Um, Sweden actually, this column over here is cleaned up uh, Methane, this is raw biogas, which is said about 60% methane and other things. And if, you're just, if you just want to burn it on site, you can use the raw biogas. But if you want to put it in a pipeline and distribute it and uh, make it equivalent to, and put it in a fuel cell especially, it has to be cleaned up. Um, Sweden is uh, really doing a lot. This figure, uh, this is cubic meters per hour. That's a lot. Uh, in fact, that is about 100, this is in the entire country of Sweden, but just to put that into perspective, this is about 150 times the amount of methane that would be needed to replace our use of methane every year, okay? That's, that's enormous. Um, and so uh, these folks are really uh, taking this seriously. Um, now, you know the old saying, uh, you don't want to know how a sausage is made? Well, this is how the biomethane is made. Um, the waste composition, 33% pig manure, 27% dairy manure, slaughterhouse, potato peels. This is what, these are three different plants in Sweden. Um, and uh, 
all of this is uh, basically taking stuff that would just be thrown away and rotting and producing methane freely going into the atmosphere. So it's also a very sustainable discipline that we're talking about here in terms of, uh, of the impact. Now, there's another option for uh, UCSB, which is kind of interesting, and that is that off the coast here, uh, especially off Coal Oil Point, um, there are natural vents of methane, and uh, they've been bubbling up for a long while. Um, uh, and uh, there have been folks, actually UCSB faculty, who have estimated the um, uh, magnitude of these. Uh, it's actually a considerable amount of methane. It's not quite enough to, uh, we need about 300 million cubic feet a year to uh, completely take care of our need. But again, if we were to capture this, we'd get credit for the fact that now it's just bubbling into the air as a very potent, uh, uh, into the atmosphere as a very potent greenhouse gas. So that's a possibility. How you do that, not so simple, and um, questions of cost and, uh, uh, other factors um, would, of course, have to be considered. I want to tell you a little bit about something Stanford is doing also. I only learned about this a couple of days ago, and it's really fascinating. Um, it's based on um, what Stanford is doing. Let me just read you the specs, first of all. It, it, they claim, uh, forget about this number, 438 million. That's Stanford, okay? They can do that. <laughs> That's what it's going to cost them. Um, uh, but let's just look at these numbers. They claim that they'll be able to recover 65% of the heat now discharged from their cooling system and meet 80% of their campus heating demands by this project. And I'll describe the project in a, more, in a moment. And also cut their greenhouse gas emissions by 50%. That's really uh, quite incredible. And they're doing it by just replumbing the campus. Um, what they did was a very interesting observation was that they, they re recognized that almost uh, every building or every unit on campus is heating and cooling often at the same time. You have equipment that has to be, even in the winter, you have labs and things that have to be cooled, and so you have chillers running, and you have heating running. They're, for the most part, two separate systems. But yet, that's kind of silly. It's a waste of energy because the, the, the heat that comes back from the chiller uh, can actually be extracted using something called a heat pump. And uh, what they did was an estimate based on uh, how this would work. And uh, this is a whole year now of uh, uh, activity uh, where this blue and red sections here are what they're not able to capture, but if they are to use something called, and I'll describe in a moment, a ground source heat pump, <clears throat> they can actually take care of that as well. And uh, this is just going to happen by virtue of the following. Uh, using, uh, and actually let me jump ahead first. What they're doing is basically they're going to install a lot of heat exchangers and in the form of heat pumps that connect <clears throat> the hot water system with the cold water system, the heating and the cooling system. And a heat pump is a really a novel device in that it doesn't generate heat, it just moves heat from one place to the other. Your refrigerator is actually the best example of a heat pump. It takes heat that's inside the refrigerator and moves it to the outside of the refrigerator, thereby cooling. And heat pumps can actually be very efficient. They're only limited by Carnot cycle, which is just determined by the temperatures of the hot and cold uh, uh, system, uh, parts of the system. And in, uh, this is only a theoretical limit, but in practical heat pumps, you can actually have efficiencies that are three or four hundred percent. And that actually gets you into a region where even for straight heating, I mean, you could say, well, why don't we just forget about natural gas for heating and we'll just use electric heating, okay? That's very expensive, about four times as expensive as the cost of natural gas. But if you use a heat pump, you can actually recapture that because they're about three to 400% efficient, and so you can get back in terms of cost. Um, and uh, this is basically the principle of what Stanford is doing. They're gonna have a whole bunch of these special heat exchangers, which consist of this intermediate loop, a compressor here, which takes um, a, a refrigerant gas in this part of it, compresses it, generates heat, 
that's then exchanged to this system through a heat exchanger and an expansion valve here which then cools the gas and puts the cooling over here. So basically they, what they're doing is they're coupling their heating and cooling systems and thereby saving a, a, a humongous amount of energy. And uh, I, I, we have to give them credit because I think it's really clever. It's going to cost them a lot of money because they have to go back and redo the plumbing through the entire campus system. That's where the 438 million comes from. Uh, but they're underway. They actually started this project uh, over a year ago. So let's talk a little bit, wind up here, about UCSB. Um, as Jordan mentioned, these are just some of the stats for UCSB. Um, we're really a small player in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Our uh, total uh, for uh, uh, scope one and two is less than 50,000 metric tons per year. And if you remember when I showed you the <clears throat> figure for uh, uh, the whole system, scope one, two, and three was about 1.6 million, scope one and two a little over 1 million. So, so we're, we're, we're actually less than 5% of the total UC system. And for us, the two big contributions, as I said, are electricity generation, where we take responsibility for the emissions that Southern California Edison uh, uh, contributes and uh, and are burning natural gas. These are the two big things. And uh, uh, what is really fantastic is that in spite of all the expansion on this campus, the uh, energy use per square foot, actually the, the total uh, energy, electric energy used has actually been declining, not growing. And per square foot, it's actually been declining significantly. And this is due to um, a lot of the terrific work that Jordan and his colleagues have been doing, largely through energy efficiency measures. Um, the same is true for natural gas, that the uh, uh, trend has been, uh, sorry, that's the price trend. Here's the usage. It's been going down in recent years. Uh, this is total number, uh, total amount of natural gas used. And, uh, so we've really had a terrific record with especially energy efficiency. We didn't get into this game of investing in um, combined heat and power generation, cogeneration, and that was probably fortuitous because if we had, we would now be going around trying to find some dairy farms and uh, others to uh, help us out. Um, we've also met our 2020 target. The university system as a whole is not. They're way off their 2020 target uh, for total emissions, but we have only one other university, and that's UC Berkeley, um, has just met um, their target also for 2020. And we're, we're meeting it early, uh, which is terrific, and, and we're on the right slope here. So a lot of good things. Um, uh, this is a picture of the demand curve for electricity on our campus. This is just Monday and Tuesday of this week. Jordan gave me this uh, really hot data straight off the press. And our demand curve actually has said, you know, it's a minimum in roughly the uh, middle of the night or the very wee hours of the morning. You might say, well, why isn't it zero? Well, there's a whole lot of things still happening. Um, a lot of students still studying, a lot of partying, everything going on. Um, uh, seven or eight megawatts, and then a peak uh, during uh, midday, work, work day of about uh, eight or nine, uh, or no, more like uh, 13 to 15 megawatts. And, and natural gas, interestingly, natural gas peaks up early in the morning, about seven or eight a.m., and then settles down for the rest of the day, and the next day it peaks up again at that time. Uh, so um, we do, um, as I said, we can't just make a humongous big investment in, in solar. Uh, that would not work for us because we wouldn't be able to, solar is not what they say dispatchable and meaning you can't match the demand and also it's just a daytime. So we do have to think about other things. We are doing some solar, there's already 220 kilowatts and there'll soon be another 500 kilowatts uh, on the uh, parking lot 22. And uh, Jordan, as I said, is working up a plan to put another four megawatts, which is big time, uh, of capacity on, um, on campus over the next couple of years. Uh, we also actually have a project that's um, supposed to come online next year for a, uh, whoop, uh, for a thermal ground source heat pump. This is actually not on this campus. It's a, 
uh, facility in the Eastern Sierra, the uh, Nevada Aquatics Research Lab. And it's uh, an interesting uh, experiment to uh, try a ground source heat pump to see if it can provide uh, the necessary heating and cooling for this facility. So we're getting our feet wet with that. Now, one of the things we did um, at UCSB uh, just uh, three weeks ago was to address this question of uh, what's needed in terms of research investments. Uh, we convened a workshop uh, through our Institute for Energy Efficiency and brought in a group of, uh, of about 30 plus people, two people from each campus and also two from uh, each of the three affiliated national labs. And it was a little interesting in that what we chose to do was to bring one researcher and one person from the, the staff side of the house who was who is, who is responsible for energy management and energy implementation. The reason being that we wanted to keep the focus on what can we do in the next 10 years in terms of research, which means it has to be applied research, that can impact the initiative uh, UC-wide. And it was fascinating to, we learned an enormous amount about what all the different campuses are doing. But also there was a considerable spirit of um, cooperation and collaboration among this group. Um, we met for a day and a half and, uh, and we came up with some recommendations. Uh, but first, let me just emphasize why I think um, research is an important part of this. Uh, first of all, there's this phenomenal resource. When you talk about 10, a team effort of 10 universities plus three national labs, all as part of the same system working towards a common goal. That's an enormously powerful team effort. And uh, the only problem with it is that most of the time it doesn't work as a team. We function as separate entities. And, uh, and there needs to be some, um, some, some, some corrections, big time, to, to deal with that. Um, uh, and research is one of the ways to do it. Um, we um, also, um, I think it's a great way to get faculty, students, and staff engaged in this uh, whole project because there's clearly a lot to be done. And one of the things that Janet Napolitano articulated, which I think is kind of neat, is to think about this whole enterprise as a living laboratory. That is, and it's her way of saying that, you know, we may not make this goal by 2025, but we're going to learn a hell of a lot along the way. And we can be a model for other, not only other universities, but other organizations, both across nationally and also globally. And, um, and, and that's pretty special in itself because the impact could be um, really uh, major. One of the things we did uh, for this research, was, uh, research workshop was to look at the current level of research in this area. And it's actually quite small. Um, uh, I was surprised that uh, a total of, uh, of actually about $400 million over the past five years, that compares to an annual uh, research budget of about $4 billion for the entire system um, per year, okay? So this is a tiny amount. What we did was we, we, we looked through the um, uh, database for grants and contracts. And second thing we learned that was interesting, that a large part of the support actually comes from California state agencies. This is not true for, if you were to do this for astrophysics, for example, you wouldn't find that to be the case. Um, but for this topic, um, the state of California has actually been very generous in supporting research, but not nearly as much as is needed. And one of the really sobering things we learned from this is that of the 840 grants total, and this is just a, a subset of them shown here to, for this distribution, but we looked at about 840 grants and contracts in total. Guess how many involved more than one campus? That it was more than zero. It was only 20, only 20, which is remarkable. Um, in fact, uh, uh, you can look at that two ways. Um, the, the positive way to look at that is there's an enormous untapped potential there for the campuses to work together on this project. Um, and, uh, and that was part of our recommendation. Now, another really neat thing that came out of this workshop was that the uh, people from Lawrence Livermore Lab uh, uh, described a, a very interesting opportunity, which is called Site 300. This is a 7,000 acre 
piece of land in the Central Valley, just about 15 miles from Lawrence Livermore Lab, that had been used by the lab for many, many years as a um, detonation site for, not for nuclear weapons, but for the triggers for nuclear weapons. And, and they did a bunch of other things there. And it's a super fun site, so they had to do some cleanup. But they're not using it anymore. And they proposed that it be used as a site for prototyping both wind and solar, and also for um, building, because land is a key issue when you're talking about massive solar uh, and uh, solar installations. And so uh, we're going to actually look into this. It's um, uh, land that is under the jurisdiction of the Department of Energy and uh, assigned to the uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab and appears could be used for this, this purpose. Um, that would be a terrific way not only to uh, concentrate our collaborative efforts in one place, but also to build um, uh, sizable uh, solar and possibly wind. There is good wind actually on this side as well, I'm told. Um, it's not actually flat, uh, even though it's in, the, it's in the upper end of the Central Valley. It's actually uh, fairly hilly land. Um, so, summary and conclusions. Um, uh, I think it's fair to say that if we wanted to, uh, of course it's a question of cost also, but if we wanted to go to carbon neutrality, zero carbon emissions in the next year, we couldn't do it. Um, the technology just isn't there. Um, the, especially the two biggies, uh, uh, which I've identified here as grand challenge number one, which is we really don't have the alternative to natural gas uh, at hand. It needs to be developed. There's a lot of opportunity for research, especially in the uh, microbiology of the fermentation process there. It probably can be substantially enhanced. Uh, the folks who are doing this now, especially in Europe, are basically companies that are using established technology. And uh, this could be, I think, uh, really uh, uh, a terrific opportunity for research. Um, uh, maybe not too, uh, a little smelly, but um, um, uh, it's important. And the second grand challenge, of course, is this question of, of, of storage. It's absolutely essential uh, if we are going to, uh, regardless of what renewable it is, the intermittency of renewable energy, whether it be wind or solar or other, is going to require some form of storage. Um, uh, that could be done in many ways. Um, it may, even if one has uh, a large uh, biomethane source on campus, you could have a small uh, peaker uh, turbine that's running on biomethane that could help you meet the variable demand as it comes and goes. Maybe we could tap into the vents offshore and do that. Who knows? Um, then uh, the um, third grand challenge is uh, is that we really need a much greater level of UC-wide cooperation and collaborative research. If we, if, we're on our, if we stay on our current path, which is largely to compete with our colleagues and other campuses, it won't happen. Um, I think that's very clear. Uh, but what I've been impressed with and, and really encouraged by is the spirit of collaboration that uh, was very evident in this workshop that we uh, hosted here at UCSB. And uh, I, think, I think this actually will will really result in some collaboration. Um, UCS, UCOP, the University uh, Office of the President, has hinted, they'd be very careful not to say anything about this, but have hinted that they're, um, that they're going to help us uh, identify some funding. And there are some terrific sources. Um, for example, AB 32, which is the cap and trade legislation that is now implemented, fully implemented in California. That produces revenue of $1 billion a year. And the first year, which was last year, Jerry Brown grabbed most of that for a combination of his high-speed rail project and some other budget balancing issues. But next year, it appears that only 60% uh, of that is already tagged for uh, use. 40% of it uh, looks like that's $400 million, looks like it's available for other purposes. And the initial wording of that legislation was that the revenues from the sale of auction credits in AB 32 should be used for investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency. So that's actually quite a good prospect. And, uh, and then there are other sources. The California Energy Commission, uh, through its new EPIC program, is providing more funding of this kind. 
I think we're probably going to um, uh, rely a lot on California sources here, but the federal government is also doing a lot. As I mentioned, there's a big program that they're initiating in biomethane. And uh, so I think there will be some funding for, uh, from the federal sources also. And again, we're in a unique position to go to a funding agency and say, look, we have a collaboration of 10 campuses with three national labs to do a project that we think can have enormous impact. That's a terrific um, opportunity from the perspective of the funding agencies. It's not every day that they get an opportunity to support something like that. Um, as I mentioned, we also have to get, for UCSB especially, we have to get direct access to wholesale electricity markets because we're clearly going to have to buy some renewable uh, electricity as well as generate our own. And lastly, um, things like this site, the 300 that I mentioned, this big plot of land uh, near Lawrence Livermore Lab, that could be the start of a really terrific research consortium that, that could be a place where we could uh, pool our efforts and also do some really uh, useful things in terms of uh, solar and other setups. So I'll stop and um, take questions. I'm over time. Apologize for that. Yes. A question about uh, the relationship with the utilities and the California ISO. Yes. Because of decoupling, they're not so much losing customer that's revenue to them. Are they actually allies in this process, advisors? Yeah. The yeah, it's, um, it's an important and a delicate question. Uh, uh, the utilities, especially the investor-owned utilities, as you know, are concerned about the fragmentation of their market. Uh, it's not just UC, but major corporations, you know, Google, Apple, others are also uh, becoming their own energy services providers. And so this is uh, basically the answer to your question is it's not known. Um, there has been some pushback from the utilities in one regard, um, and that is that if you are not um, an energy services provider, meaning you, you do not have access to the wholesale market. If you're generating excess renewable energy, you're limited up to, you can only put into the grid for credit one megawatt maximum. Um, and that's a ruling that is now very controversial that is being um, addressed. I didn't say it, but there's enormous opportunity here, especially for um, uh, students and faculty from Bren who are interested in the policy and regulatory issues of this to uh, really delve into some of these questions such as what you just asked because it's thick, very thick with regard to not just um, regulatory issues, uh, pricing issues, um, political issues. Uh, as you probably know, the California Public Utilities Commission is in a chaotic state right now because the president has stepped down because there's been a, a long history of a rather cozy relationship between the, um, at least the claim is there's been a too cozy, too much of a cozy relationship between CPUC and the utilities in terms of favoring them when CPUC is supposed to be regulating them. So there's a whole lot of stuff out there that is ripe for uh, study and analysis and change. Yes? What is the relative um, value of, you said scope three or tier three, I can't remember, versus the one and two? Yes. The relative value for us and for the UC, it's about a third. Uh, and actually, the single biggest source for us on this campus, just by a hair, is now. Uh, uh, travel and commuting. It's, it's, it's actually air travel. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's hard to estimate accurately because you have to, you, the, you know, when you fly and you file your expense voucher, you don't say how many <laughs> greenhouse gas, uh, the tons of carbon dioxide equivalent were, were generated. And so the way it's been done is to look at the um, costs of travel and to use uh, and to calibrate that by some known uh, uh, airline data that that correlates uh, miles with uh, 
uh, with carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so those figures are not really hard numbers, but it's a significant amount. Um, the, um, the big issue there is actually um, one that has to do with the federal government in that uh, when, uh, because most of it, as you know, is, is resulting from travel on grants and contracts. And, uh, and it would be very nice if the federal agencies were to take some responsibility for that and to allow either in the indirect cost charges or through a direct charge for the fact that that travel, which is necessary for the grant, you know, a lot of it is a go and report to your, your, your agency, uh, does generate carbon dioxide emissions and, and, and thereby implement a carbon tax. Uh, and it could be done in a stealth way, I think, through the indirect cost. Wouldn't be entirely stealth because I'm sure the folks in the Congress um, would not be happy about it. Um, but uh, that's needed. Um, one of the uh, members of our um, Global Climate Leadership Council um, at Berkeley would like to propose that each campus institute a carbon accounting system. That is, each college or each department uh, has some measure of their contribution to greenhouse gases rather than just this is the campus as a whole number. That, I'm not in favor of that myself. And the reason I'm not in favor of it is because when you get down to this issue that you asked about how big is the part having to do with air travel, there's no way to cover it. Um, you know, the next step to doing carbon accounting is to do carbon cost accounting, okay? And until the federal government takes responsibility for the fact that they are really causing a lot of this travel through grants and contracts and do something to, to deal with it, it would be, I think, foolish for us to, to do that local cost accounting. I gave you a longer answer than you expected. But there's a big issue there. I think you understand it, though, Phil. Yeah, yeah. The, yes? Yeah, interestingly, that has not come up. There were a lot of things that didn't come up. You'll, you'll notice I didn't say anything about nuclear energy, OK? I mean, we could build you know, these new Gen 4 nuclear reactors that are small and compact. We could build one of those and be pretty much home free on our campus, right? Because that's base load. You know, they can chug along and provide everything. Um, would you like to propose that we put a nuclear reactor on this campus? Um, uh, no, and, and the same is true for, for um, a lot of these other issues. Carbon capture, uh, not because it's unpopular, but just because of the cost and the technology is really just not mature yet. Um, uh, you could do it, but it would add 50% to the cost of any natural gas fired cogeneration co system. And the folks who made those investments in those six campuses that I pointed out to you, they, um, they would, I mean, that would wipe out all their, their financial gains um, and more. Um, so there was very little support for that. Um, uh, there were, um, those were the two main items that didn't get on the agenda for those reasons, different reasons. Yes. In the way that you discussed balancing renewables and energy and storage, I got the sense that the campuses will literally be islanded off as a mini grid. Is that the case? Not necessarily. No, I think I think that um, given that uh, well, if you take this 80 megawatt solar plan, okay, uh, that electricity generated by those um, solar PV arrays is going to be distributed through the grid to five or six campuses. And so there'll be more of that. And so there will be more sharing of that kind. But at the same time, each campus is encouraged to do their own on-site installations. Um, and uh, in principle, um, you know, we could go entirely through a UC-wide system and just see what happens. Uh, but we're at a disadvantage, as I said, because we don't currently have direct access to the wholesale market. Um, we're trying to find a way to get around that, and it looks like we might be able to, but so far that hasn't happened. 
Maybe I misunderstood your question. Did I? I had a quick second follow-up. Okay. That's right. That whole thing. I mean, is that part yep. of the plan? Well, uh, you know, the Tahiguas, our uh, landfill, which is the Tahiguas landfill here in Santa Barbara County, actually is planning to uh, build a uh, biomethane facility. Uh, the problem with landfill in this country is that we don't separate organic waste from other. And, uh, and so they have to do that at the landfill site, which is very inefficient. Yeah, it's a mess. It's a mess. And yeah, it's a mess. And also, there is a movement afoot to actually reduce the amount of landfill through effective recycling. San Francisco actually has on the books, and I can't remember what it is, but over the next five to 10 years, they're planning to go to zero landfill. So landfill is not a long-term solution. Um, agriculture, I did a calculation about how many cows would be needed um, if we were to just look at dairy as a source for biomethane. Um, it turns out we'd need something like 10 to 20,000 cows to satisfy our need. Um, and the UC system would need about 10 times as many cows as there are in the whole state of California. <laughs> the, the number of cows I know is 1.7 million dairy cows in, in, uh, in California. And that would assume that you know, all the farmers are willing, because you know, if you're going to come in and, and, and do this in a dairy farm, it's very disruptive. And, and you know, what's in it for the farmers? They need to get something out of it, right? So uh, biomethane is, uh, is possible, but it's complicated. And uh, the, the European example, I think, is one we need to take a very close look at, because they seem to be doing quite well by it. I don't know if you caught the uh, numbers on that chart that I showed you, but there are 9,000 biomethane facilities in Germany. They're mostly small. A lot of them are just burning the raw methane uh, and not cleaning it on site. But uh, that's a significant practice. And they're learning as they evolve this. And, and they're also being, you know, it's part, as I said, of the, the, the discipline and culture of sustainability. They're using their waste materials in a very productive way. Um, we're known to be a rather wasteful country in that regard. Yeah, let's take one last question. Jordan should be shutting this down by now, but I'll, take, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah, not much because those are a very small part. But there are um, a lot of efforts. Actually, San Diego uh, especially has almost entirely electrified their fleet, their, their on-site fleet. We're not talking about commuters here, um, the, the, the vehicles that come under scope one. We've been doing a lot of that. And I don't know if um, um, uh, you've been following it, but uh, there's a fair amount of it on our campus as well. and. Uh, and there is, of course, this uh, notion out there that if electric vehicles ever become widespread and used, for example, for commuting by a large percentage of our campus population, then that's a possible storage vehicle as well. Um, that's, again, complicated and uh, not clear just how easy it would be to manage. But uh, there are a whole lot of things out here. I think that, the, let me just take one last comment, <laughs> and then we'll finish up. I think the message I want to leave you with is that this is something to take seriously. Um, ultimately, as a civilization, we're going to have to go in this direction, OK? So why not be out front? Maybe we'll fall on our sword. Maybe we won't get there by 2025. But why not be out front and, uh, and, and lead the call and, and see what we can learn along the way? Because there's a lot that can be done here. And um, I'm especially enthused myself by the opportunities for research, because I think there, there are any number of things. In this area of storage, there's just an enormous amount of things that can be uh, looked at, many of them at the basic research level. Uh, biomethane also is something that has a lot of opportunity. And also on the policy and regulatory side, studies of that kind, 
lots to do. So there's a lot of PhD theses and other, <laughs> other master's projects that could be uh, pulled out of this. Uh, okay. <laughs>